Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Bostic, and I am the Sustainable Agriculture Extension Agent with the University of Florida in Sarasota County. And as I have been for the last 25 weeks of this wonderful edible gardening series, I am joined today with my coworkers, Carol Wyatt Evans, who's the Chemicals and the Environment Agent in, with the University of Florida in Sarasota County, and our wonderful coworker, Mindy Hannock, who is the School and Community Garden Coordinator for Sarasota County. Um, this is our final class in the edible gardening series. Um, and Carol and I are actually going to team teach this class. It's going to be a little bit, little bit more talking than we normally do. Um, and Mindy is going to do the wonderful role that she has done every class th thus far in our series, which is to moderate the chat box. Um, because these classes have so many people in them, we ask you to um, put your questions, comments, um, ideas, um, things like that right in, right in that chat box. Um, share, your, share your thoughts with other people who are part of this Edible Gardening Series community. And, um, and then once Carol and I are done presenting, we are gonna open up to any and all um, edible gardening questions um, for our final class. So here we go, session number 25. Um, this session, we are actually doing two topics. We're gonna do companion planting and trap crops. And as we tell you each week, um, we started this series about seven, seven or eight months ago because we just were hearing so consistently from folks that they were really struggling to successfully garden in Florida and other places in the country. Um, you know, some people, they were struggling to garden for the first time ever, and some people were just struggling with things that they've kind of struggled with for a long time. So we created this series to go through those biggest questions that we tend to hear from gardeners. And so if you missed any of the previous classes, um, there is the list of all the topics that we've gone over so far. And at the end of the class, we're gonna share a link to our website. And actually Mindy can pop that right into the chat box as well as we go. Um, so we've covered so many class, so many topics over the last 25 weeks. Um, and we hope that you've really enjoyed um, any or all classes that you have attended with us. And what we didn't tell you as we got going with this series is that we actually had an overarching goal for the whole series from the very beginning. And that was really to provide you, you as gardeners or aspiring gardeners with a framework, a framework where you can actually see and learn and observe from your own garden um, and to really encourage you to do that observing and learning from your own unique garden because every garden is incredibly unique. And Another overarching goal we had is simply that as you continue to observe and learn and make changes based on your own observations in your own garden, the less reliant that you become on things like chemical interventions to control pests or the use of environmentally damaging soil amendments or overuse of our really precious water supplies, right? Those are some of the, the, the goals that we've had for this series and most importantly, probably to most of you, is we also hope that with what you've learned, you've become a better gardener. So today's topics really tie all of these pieces together that we've been talking about over the last seven or eight months of classes. And it's really two different, two totally different topics that we often hear people um, using these two terms interchangeably, companion planting and trap crops, right? Those are actually Two, two distinctly different things. And we're gonna go into how they're different and what you need to know about both of them. And we're really gonna to try to frame out how everything that you've learned over the last 25 classes really feeds into this whole idea of both companion planting and trap cropping. Carol, your turn. Oh, did we lose Carol? Sorry, forgot to unmute. There we go. <laughs> Do you want me to go? You want me to just go ahead and go off of your slide? Yeah, go for it. So here, okay, here, hold on a second. So, okay, so trap crops. So a trap crop is a, is a host plant that is irresistible to specific insect pests. So uh, the crop is considered a sacrificial crop since its job really is just to protect that edible crop. Um, by drawing those insects away. Um, if the trap crop is available, then the insects are gonna move onto that preferred host if it's given a choice. So the great thing about trap crops is that they're great in that they decrease the need for insecticides, right? So that's one of those things we talk about with IPM is, is reducing our, our input of, of uh, pesticides. So, and 
in turn, they support conservation of natural enemies and increase environmental quality through that reduction of pesticides, whether it be biopesticides or conventional pesticides. Of course, most of us are, you know, if we are spraying, it's biopesticides, but, um, you know, if you are doing conventional, this is going to reduce both of those. And even if you, you know, you are spraying biopesticides, if you can reduce those, that's still better yet. So, now, I know when we think of using pesticides, it's usually on that large scale crop production and not so much our urban, our urban gardening, but we can adjust um, trap, trap cropping to fit this garden space to help us and to contain those uh, destructive insects where we want them to be. So, you know, if we can draw them away from our good plants and get them onto the plants that we, you know, that are the sacrificial plants, those, that's, you know, the best thing we can do. So again, this is going to decrease that need to apply any type of pesticide to our garden crops. So in a few slides, um, we'll have a table that shows a list of trap crops and the insects that they attract, but the list is far from exhaustive. So we have to remember that gardening, like everything else, is a, it's a dynamic process, right? So sometimes things are going to work, sometimes they're not. So you're just going to have to have this kind of, um, you know, a, a trial and error period with, with your gardening when it comes to the trap crops. Um, so, you know, that's going to include things like, you know, not only, you know, as far as the trial and error, uh, things like, you know, knowing your planting dates, um, your weather, your soil compositions, um, the insect pests that are going to come along as, as well as the biological controls that come along. So again, your, your gardening is dynamic and trap crops are going to help you with those processes in the meantime. So the key to trap cropping is timing. Insects are highly attracted to the reproductive stages of plants over that vegetative stage. So you can use this to your advantage. The trap crops are planted first, so they're going to be flowering and producing fruit when your garden crop is planted. That way those pest insects will be drawn to that trap crop and leave those other plants alone. So it's good to continue to plant those trap crops so that there will always be a reproductive stage of that more desirable plant um, in your garden. So where do you plant trap crops? Well, trap crops can be planted on the perimeter of the garden or by intercropping, which just means you're going to be alternating that planting that, that uh, row of trap crops with a garden row. Perimeter is usually the most successful since the insects enter from the side of the garden. And the reason we tend to find more insects issue on the outside edge of the garden, right? It's because they enter from those sides. But trap crops are not the answer to all the garden problems, right? Trap cropping management can be labor intensive. You either have to manually remove the insects or kill them with insecticides. Manual remover, removing can be done by hand picking. You can net the insects, or you can actually even vacuum the insects from the plants. But you can also remove that entire plant that's infested. So once it's infested, you can remove it, but just be sure that you have other trap plants, right, still in the garden that are producing flowers or fruit so that those pest insects have somewhere to go besides that main garden plant. So scouting should be done daily and not let um, the insect numbers build up because that can actually backfire on you and turn it actually into a nursery crop instead of a trap crop. So it's important to keep good records of what shows up, when it shows up, and what other plants it might show up on. So again, we're talking about integrated pest management through all of this. So next slide, please. So now if you Google trap crops, the one that's going to show up in almost all searches is blue Hubbard squash. So blue Hubbard are the um, two bluish squashes that are in the pile of that winter squash. So blue Hubbard squash is an important trap crop for attracting squash bugs, squash vine borer, and cucumber beetles. These particular insects are common in the garden and can be quite devastating. So being proactive and preventing the insect from entering the crop in the first place is going to make your life much easier in the garden. So other trap crops for stink bug management include things like okra, green bean, sunflower, and sorghum. One of the um, pluses about trap crop is that trap crop seeds are relatively inexpensive and usually readily available. So you're not spending a great deal of money on planting that sacrificial crop. There are two methods that are used in planting trap crops. One is using the same species as the trap crop, and the second is using a different crop species. When you're using the same species, the trap plants are planted much earlier than that main crop. 
and they're used as a, a food source for those pests. So the plants are then sprayed or destroyed um, before they can attack that main crop. So this is going to work well with like things like especially tomatoes. So as the, as the trap crop tomatoes start to flower and fruit, that's when you're going to want to plant your, your main uh, crops, right? But when you're using a different species um, for a trap crop, um, this is much more attractive than um, the main crop. An example of that is sunflowers. So sunflowers are a particularly good trap crop trap crop, it's hard to say, not only um, because they're beautiful, they're really robust plants, but they're also excellent poll pollinator plants. It's also very attractive to leaf-footed bugs, which feed on uh, developing fruit. But remember, it's all about timing. The sunflower needs to be planted early enough in the season so that it's blooming by the time that leaf-footed bug shows up. So they show up in high numbers, so be prepared for them to be, um, you know, be prepared for them as being really important because you're going to um, you're going to need to take care of them right away because if they get out of control they get out of control fast. Next slide please. So making an IPM plan. So the important uh, thing about all of this and something that's been stressed um, both directly and subtly throughout this entire series is using integrated pest management. IPM means being proactive and practicing prevention versus being reactive once that problem sets in. So you would not put a plant in the ground without any effort to provide the best environment for that plant to thrive, right? So thinking about the environment before planting and all the way through that disposal of that plant after the season is over and everything that happens in between those two points, that is all IPM. So part of making an IPM plan is understanding that pest that you're trying to manage. The seedling in the picture is about the size uh, your blue hubbards should be when you put them in the garden. You want to place that seedling in the garden, uh, but only plant them once you once the first sign of that squash bug or the squash vine borer or the cucumber beetle shows up. Of course, this means you will be scouting and monitoring your garden on a regular basis. Once you see that insect, then you transplant uh, the healthy Blue Hubbard seedlings near where you want to grow um, your other curcubits. So you're going to direct seed your other curcubits, right? So these are going to be right next to it. So you're kind of actually intercropping is, is what this is, this is called. So you're going to continue to scout daily for eggs, immature insects, or adults um, that you find on those Blue Hubbards. And be sure to make sure you check the lower side of the leaf, right? Because remember, they really like to be on the, the um, adults, females lay eggs on the lower side of that leaf. So you can use a hand lens to identify the eggs. So as I've said before, pur purchasing a hand lens will be the best dollar you've ever spent in your life. And keeping good records of what you find, um, where you find it, when you found it, how many you found, and the environmental conditions that were there when you found it. So this is going to help you season to season, year to year, when knowing what to expect and, and when to expect it. Next slide, please. Okay, so talk about squash bugs real quick. So um, what are you looking at? Know the insect. Remember, proper identification of the insect is imperative to uh, know if it needs to be managed or if it's a beneficial insect. Also, have an idea of their life cycle. It's important in controlling the insect. The immature stage of most insects tend to be the most destructive, but in this case of the squash bug, the adult is quite destructive as well. So the life cycle of a squash bug is, is about, you know, Six to, uh, six to eight weeks, squash bugs have one generation per year in the north climates, two to three generations per year in the southern uh, or the warmer climates. Um, they, bo this, the, uh, both sexes uh, winter over as adults. So they're gonna, you know, they're basically going into diapause and they come back out and emerge and start producing right away. They prefer overrunning sites uh, in, in the fields under crop debris, in um, clumps of soil or in stones, um, but they also can be in the, like if you're next to like a wooded area, they'll also you know, harbor in there. So again, this is really important to remove crop debris when we talk about the end of season. You don't just, you know, let it go and, and deal with it the next year because you're going to be harboring pests throughout, the, throughout your winter, winter time. Eggs um, of the 
of the squash bug are, again, they deposit them on the lower leaf. Um, occasionally, you're going to find them on the upper, upper leaf or on the leaf, leaf petiole, but for the most part, it's going to be on the lower leaf. Um, they're elliptical and somewhat flattened and, and bronze in color. This is really important to know because there's a lot of different insects that lay eggs on leaves, right? So knowing what those, those eggs look like is important. Um, they're usually pretty small, about 1.5 millimeters in length, in length, and most of the time they cluster together in about a, a, a cluster of 20. Um, sometimes they're laid individually, but most of the time they're clustered. Um, and then sometimes they actually lay them equal distance apart. So no matter how they're laid, they're going to be identical to each other in that, in that cluster. But no matter what the insect it is, it's good to have a general idea of the pest insect's life cycle and which life stage is most damaging within that, within that insect. Next, please. So with the squash bug, um, the nymphs have a five nymphal instars, in remember? So once they hatch out of the egg, each of those, every time they molt, they get bigger. It's an instar. So that first hatch out of the egg is called the first instar. So they have five instars and they take about 33 days to develop. The first instar is uh, pretty small, is this light green color. You can see it. Oh, I'm not using my computer, sorry. Um, is that light green, does not look like a squash bug, looks like a, a just some weird looking alien thing. Um, they're lime green. By the time they reach their that last instar stage, they're a dark gray color. So as they as they molt through those instar stages, they get bigger and they get darker and they're looking more and more like a squash bug. Um, any insect like like the squash bug that has um, that have incomplete metamorphosis remember those have those three life stages the egg the nymph and the adult um, that thorax and the wing pads are barely noticeable at, at the hatch so you can't even see that they have wings um, but as they as they progress through those those nymphal stage those wing pads become beca become wing buds and then become wings and as they that last molt into adult. The adults are about two centimeters in length, a little bit smaller, but, but up to two centimeters. They're dark gray. Um, they have this uh, kind of a little bit of striping on the back edges of their, of their abdomen. Um, they're long lived as far as uh, insects go, so they can live up to 130 days, which is a long time for an insect. Um, but their longevity depends on both the availability and the quality of the food. So knowing that whole life stage is going to be really important. Like if you saw these insects, what would you think they were? Would you think they'd need to be to be controlled? So next, please. Oh, and it's Sarah's turn. Okay, so. <laughs> Carol went into wonderful detail about squash bugs, which are one of the insects that does a huge amount of damage to a lot of the different squashes and cucumbers and pumpkins and um, zucchini and summer squash and things like that, but there's others. Um, and I'm not gonna go into significant detail um, because you now know what kind of research you need to do to learn about what you need to, and what you need to learn about different kinds of insects to control them well. Um, and so, um, squash vine borers are a very common pest of that whole family of crops called the cucurbits, um, which has all the you know pumpkins and squashes and um, cucumbers and things like that in it. And unlike squash bugs, uh, you don't you don't tend to actually notice the eggs, the adults, or the larvae until it is much too late. Um, this is this is the stage of squash vine borers that does all of the damage. Um, it is a pretty pretty gross looking um, little little larvae um, that looks like a maggot um, growing in um, in the stem of a plant generally near the base of the plant. Usually the first thing you noticed is is actually something like this. This is actually its poop um, otherwise known as frass. Frass is the the technical term in the insect world for insect poop. Um, so usually you're not actually going to see um, so many obvious signs like you do with, with squash bugs. So let me show you, oops, my screen doesn't wanna change. So these are the two things that you might be looking for that are not the easiest things to find. So on the left side of your screen is a squash vine borer egg. And unlike, um, unlike those 
actually kind of beautiful bronze colored uh, eggs that are laid in clusters by squash bugs. Squash vine borers lay tiny little fairly nondescript eggs one at a time, just somewhere on the stem of a plant. Um, so it makes them much more difficult to find. And then the adults also don't look like anything that could possibly be involved in that horrible little maggot thing that crawls out of your plants. Um, this right here is actually what the adult squash vine borer looks like. Um, and it does not look like a moth, but it is in fact a moth. And there are two things that are really unique about squash vine borer moths. One is that they actually have clear wings. Um, that's really unusual in the world of moths. Um, so you, you don't necessarily even recognize it as a moth. And the other thing that's really different about it is that it's active during the day and not at night. Um, and it's actually a pollinator. It, it flutters from flower to flower um, of all sorts of plants um, doing what pollinators do. So you don't necessarily even register it as as a squash vine borer um, larvae that's burrowing into your into your plants, so that makes that makes it so much harder to recognize that you are about to have a problem. Um, and so that's one of the things that's so great about using trap crops is that that's your first indication that you're about to have trouble in your other plants. Cucumber beetles are kind of similar. Um, there's a few different kinds of cucumber beetles. The most common are um, spotted cucumber beetles and striped cucumber beetles. They're, they're small, they're fast, they fly really quickly. Um, their, their eggs are only laid um, in little, in clusters of between just one and four eggs. And again, the, their eggs are so tiny that you probably won't ever actually even see one. And their larvae also look like little maggots. Um, and they're, they're, or, but they are little maggots. And um, they're, they're also so tiny that you're not really even going to see them unless you're looking really hard for them. So usually your first indication that you have an issue is when you see the adults and the adults tend to show up in mass um, and start breeding very copiously, um, very, very quickly uh, all over your plants while they are eating those plants. Um, so trap crops are an amazing way to recognize that an invasion has just begun and you can start dealing with it before the actual, actual plants that you do want to harvest from pop up out of the ground. So I'm going to talk really briefly about um, another kind of, um, of insect. It is called a brown marmorated stink bugs. Um, brown marmorated stink bugs are not quite established in Florida yet. Um, they're an invasive species in the United States um, and they love all sorts of soft bodied fruits like tomatoes, peppers, peaches, um, apples, pears, pretty, pretty much any soft bodied fruit they love. And I'll tell you in a second why I am telling you about this, even though they are not established in Florida yet. But I'm going to show you a couple of pictures from a few years ago when I was farming in the mountains of North Carolina. And stink bugs, um, mount, brown marmorated stink bugs, are very well established there. And they do a huge amount of damage. Um, and you can't see enormously well in this picture, but this is called a lunchbox pepper. So it's just a small kind of two bite pepper. And that's the, that's the stink bug right there. Um, and you can see these kind of strange. Um, colorations that look a little bit like someone took an eraser and just kind of lessened the amount of color. That's stink bug damage. And very quickly, um, once stink bugs have pierced into that fruit, um, suck some juices out, that fruit will start to go downhill pretty quickly. It doesn't hold up very long after it's been um, pierced by a stink bug. And you can see what this looks like in a tomato. This is a, um, one of my favorite varieties of tomato called Cherokee purple. And you can see it looks kind of like a constellation all over the top of this, this tomato. All of those little constellation-like patterns, that's stink bug damage. That is where stink bugs pierced into that fruit, um, opened that fruit up to, to bacteria and viruses and fungus. Um, and you can see how it's quickly becoming rotten spots on an otherwise, what otherwise would have been a beautiful sellable fruit. So this, I know you can't see this, um, this map particularly well, it's a pretty low resolution image, but this is a map of where brown marmorated stink bugs have become really entrenched in the United States. And again, remember, they're an invasive species, so they're not native um, here at all. And just a few years ago, um, they started to slowly, they're starting to slowly make their way into Northern Florida. 
it's not it's not definite yet that they're here and established. Um, although there is suspicion that there is one established breeding population in the very far northern part of the state in the Lake City region. So the reason that I'm telling you about brown marmorated stink bugs is to remind you that we have a huge impact on how insects end up in different places. Um, brown marmorated stink bugs are actually found all over Florida, but just kind of one off. And the way they get here is by traveling in people's luggage, um, in cargo trucks, in um, the back of your trunk when you've gone on vacation somewhere. They come with us, right? We are the ones who move insects around. Um, and so we need to always be on our toes about what's in our gardens, right? Because it may not be what you think is going to be there. And this is also simply a reminder that that we also are all of our actions, whether they be you know traveling across state lines or how we're managing our gardens, has an impact on the insect life um, in, in our gardens and in our spaces. Um, you know things like the overuse of pesticides means that there are some populations of insects that will become increasingly difficult to control. And that's why things like using trap crops that help you minimize the use of pesticides is so important. So this is another picture that I took. Um, and I didn't realize it when I was starting to farm in North Carolina, but sunflowers are used as a very, very well-known and well-loved trap crop in that area. And I very quickly discovered on my own um, what an effective trap crop they were. And you can see in this picture that's really well hidden. This is just a single head of a, of a sunflower, but there are three um, brown marmorated stink bugs that you can see right there. And there's actually many, many more stink bugs on this single head of sunflower um, that you can't see. Um, they, they love hiding in little nooks and little crannies and sunflowers give them that perfect place. So as Carol mentioned earlier, um, there's a certain stage of sunflower that stink bugs and other, um, other types of bugs like best. And it's when they're, it's not, the, the, the sunflower that you see in this picture is not that perfect stage. Um, this is a very mature, producing mature seed hunt sunflower head. My favorite stage is actually um, called the milky sap stage excuse me, milky sap stage. So when that stink bug pierces the back of a sunflower head, there's actually some white um, white juice that oozes out. It's like a milky sap that comes out of that flower. That's the perfect stage. So if you're, if you're wanting to use something like sunflowers as a trap crop um, for the kind of stink bug or leaf-footed bug or other kind of insect that loves sunflowers where you live, make sure that you plant it multiple times during the season so that there's always some in your garden in that perfect milky sap stage. You also get beautiful flowers um, for a much longer period of time. And so in Florida, um, there is also all sorts of research happening around stink bug and leaf-footed bug trap crops. Um, their sunflowers are very established in other parts of the country. A lot of research has gone into the best cover, the best trap crops to use for, for different kinds of stink bugs. Um, sunflowers really rise to the top. And in Florida, sunflowers are also rising to the top, um, as is things like sorghum and millet and wheat. So there's, there's still so much to learn. And one thing I just want to point out um, in this picture, um, you can see right here on the right bottom corner of your screen, that's where the sunflowers are in this garden. And that's a perfect place for, for things like drawing stink bugs and leaf-footed bugs away from your plants. Um, bring them to the edge rather than putting them right there in the middle mixed in with the susceptible crops. It's a great way for you to pull those, pull those insects away from the main body of your, of your garden. And Carol, back to you. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, as we said earlier, um, that there was going to be a list of trap uh, trap crop plants, and so here are some some great ones that we have normally in our garden. And just so you know that these are not exhaustive, so these are just kind of recommendations. But it's really kind of a a, um, a you know you can trial out different things and see you know even by what you notice already in your garden what plants um, some of these insects prefer in your garden as it is you can establish those as your own trap crops and plant them accordingly right so um, you know things that I, 
I really like are nasturtiums. Nasturtiums are just an amazing, beautiful flower. They're edible, but boy, do aphids love them. So having nasturtiums in your garden, one can be as a trap crop, but you can also plant them for your, for your own, um, you know, for to put in your salads and um, you know they drop their seeds they reseed really easily so there's something that can uh, re-establish themselves over and over again but having things also I think we're going to talk about marigolds in a few minutes so I won't say anything but that but you know if you look at these there's a lot of different um, plants that have these beautiful flowers right so as we were talking about they like those those fruiting bodies so um, not only are they good for your trap crops, they're going to be a beautiful, make your, your garden even more beautiful. So <laughs> something I, I, I appreciate. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay, so my, my screen doesn't want to change again. Hold on one second. There we go. Okay. So we're going to shift over now to talking about companion planting. And so the basic idea behind companion planting is that there are certain plants that are mutually beneficial to one another when planted together and certain plants that, that are not great when they're planted together. They don't, they don't grow well together. Um, so there, there, this, is, um, this is a topic that I, I really enjoy talking about because there's actually a lot of gray area in this idea of companion planting. And um, a lot of gardeners really don't want gray area um, when, it, when it comes to gardening advice, but this is one where there really is. Um, and it's really about what you are observing in your own spaces to help you make your own decisions. So you can see in, in these pictures right here, um, there are a variety of plants that are commonly grown together that you'll see on, on a lot of companion planting charts. Um, you can see tomatoes, marigolds, lettuce, basil, a um, couple other things growing in there. That's, you know, that's a, a fairly common sort of pairing of companion plants that you might see on, on charts. I also really like this picture because I think this garden design with built-in benches is so neat. Um, and I wanted to show you that also. So one of the things that has always, um, has always been a little odd to me is how, how incredibly black and white companion planting charts are. Um, there's so many, if you, do, if you just do an internet search for a companion planting chart, dozens of different charts that tell you what plants you should plant together and which plants you shouldn't will pop up. And for me, gardening and farming has never been a black and white thing. There's so much gray area and so much nuance and there's so much, um, seasonality and depending on where you are geographically and so so many other things that go into what what does work and what doesn't in a garden or a growing space. And so I love talking about companion planting um, and I think it's a great way to wrap up the series because really what companion planting is all about is observing and thinking and learning based on your own unique garden and growing space. So one of the things that's so important when you are looking at companion planting charts, if you are if you are someone who really loves those companion planting charts or feels like you should be following them, is always ask why and how. And one of the best ways to <laughs> one of the best ways to really describe why it's so important to ask why and how in terms of those recommendations that you see on charts is marigolds. So you talked, so if anyone doesn't remember what a marigold is or is unsure what a marigold is, um, very briefly, um, and there's a, we did a whole episode on nematodes about five months ago, I think. Um, a nematode is a microscopic roundworm that burrows its way into the root system of plants. And actually most nematodes don't burrow into plants. Most nematodes um, are um, affect, um, fungus or other microbes or all, all sorts of things. So it is widely held amongst a lot of gardeners that marigolds get rid of nematodes. And so once you start actually digging into that, you discover that that is not quite the whole story. So there are over 25,000 species of nematodes. They are actually the most diverse um, uh, section of uh, microbial life in, in the world. It's a pretty amazing thing. And there are also hundreds of varieties of marigolds. 
right? That's a huge amount of diversity in there. 25,000 species of nematodes and hundreds of varieties of marigolds. So when you actually start to look at what research is showing, it's that some varieties of marigolds um, do suppress some species of nematodes, but some combinations of nematodes and marigolds are actually um, not a great combination because some species of nematodes love some varieties of marigolds and you'll actually increase your populations. So many, many varieties of marigolds will also suppress some of the beneficial nematodes that are in, in your soil. But even that is not the whole story because living marigolds aren't actually what is suppressing nematodes in your soil. It's only in the process of rotting, actually dying and rotting and releasing the chemicals that are held within the body of the marigolds that that nematode suppression happens. So that's, that to me is such a good way to frame out the story of why you should always ask why and how and want more information before you just follow some information on a chart. So after all of that, should I plant marigolds? And yes, plant marigolds. Um, and if you want to make sure that the type of marigolds you're growing are going to help suppress some of the nematodes that you struggle with in your own garden, once those nematodes die and you incorporate them into the soil, um, we're going to share we're going to share some research um, with you in a follow up email so that you know which kinds of marigolds you want to be searching for, depending on what kind of nematodes are common in your area. So there's so many reasons to plant marigolds, right? They're beautiful, they're edible. A lot of people don't know that, but they are edible. They provide food to pollinators. Um, they just bring such cheer and color into a garden, and they might actually deter some pest insects. They're, that's still kind of up for debate, but that's where you get to be the observant um, citizen science in your own garden, C citizen scientist in your own garden. Observe whether or not you see them actually deterring pests in your own garden. So another example that I see on pretty much every companion planting chart that I can find is pole beans and beets. And the, this is an example um, on a chart of why you should ask um, why you should ask why on the on the list that tells you why not to plant things together. So whole beans and beans are almost always listed as two things that you should not grow together. So why, right? So I dug and dug and dug because I've always been curious. I've always just thought that was kind of an, an odd thing. And I finally for this um, for making this class started digging around. And really what I could find about why you should not plant pole beans and beets together is because untrellised pole beans will smother beets, right? So this picture that you can see on your screen, oops, um, this, this picture right here, these are pole beans that are growing up a trellis. You can imagine if those were not growing up a trellis, but instead were just sprawling across the ground, they, they would definitely kill your beets. They would also smother pretty much everything else in your garden. So I am not personally sure, um, nor can I find any, um, any information at all about why pole beans and beets should not be grown together um, as opposed to pole beans and carrots or, or beets and something else. So based on what I've been able to find about why I think beets and pole beans end up on the do not plant together list, um, I think some of the solutions that you can use in your own garden if you really want to grow pole beans and beets side by side is that you, or, or beans rather, and, and beets side by side, is that you can plant bush beans, which only get about five or six inches tall. Um, well, some, some of them get a couple feet tall rather than pole beans, right? Then you don't have to worry about those beans smothering those beets. Another option is that once your pole beans start to really climb that trellis and based on your own observations from previous seasons, you know how big those vines are gonna get and how far outside of the trellis they're gonna sprawl, then you can plant your beets, right? So there's so many ways, like once you start asking why, options really start to open up. But there actually are some plants that do some, um, some genuine harm to other plants, even if you have them spaced at what seems like an appropriate distance from each other. And this is a category of plants that are um, uh, called allelopath allelopathic plants. And that's a very fancy um, technical word that sim simply means um, that they are plants that produce some sort of chemical that 
inhibits or prevents the germination and or the growth of other plants. There is a huge variety of allelopathic chemicals that are produced by different plants. Some of them produce chemicals that only affect a few other types of plants. Um, some even suppress the germination of other plants um, in the same species. Some produce chemicals that affect most plants. Um, and then there's so many different ways that allelopathic chemicals actually get out of the plant and impact its environment. Um, some, are act some actually ooze that chemical from their roots. Um, some release a chemical while they're rotting in the ground. Um, there's so many different ways that, that allelopath allelopathic plants do their thing. A really, a really traditional, um, pretty famous example of an allelopathic plant um, is a, a family of, of nuts um, called the Juglandiaceae family. And that includes walnuts, butternuts, um, which is butternut nuts, not butternut squash, um, pecans, and hickory. Those are all, um, all in a family that produce allelopathic chemicals. And they will suppress the growth of a lot of vegetables, especially the tomato family vegetables. But again, not all of the vegetables are affected by them. So another one that I see a lot on a lot of lists is um, broccoli and cauliflower should not be planted with peppers. And I've always been really curious about this. So I finally went and did some more digging and I found some really funny things. So broccoli and cauliflower are part of a very large family of vegetables that we, that we eat. Mo much of the common vegetables we eat are actually in this family called the brassica family. And the brassica family includes things like radishes and arugula, um, a lot of the greens that are in mescaline mix, um, tot soy, bok choy, cabbage, Chinese cabbage, um, radishes, turnips, uh, rutabaga, uh, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, um, Romanesco broccoli, so many things. There's, it, the list goes on and on. And so that's one thing that's funny to me from the beginning because broccoli and cauliflower are the only two plants in the brassica family that I ever see paired on these charts with bad with peppers. And that to me is really funny, especially because, and this is really neat, I'm guessing not many people know this, um, cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, kohlrabi, and Brussels sprouts are actually botanically the same plant. Um, we think of them as being distinctly different vegetables, but they actually are not. Um, they are, botanically speaking, the same plant that we have just bred and bred and bred over many hundreds of years of being human beings, liking to change the food that we're eating into looking very, very different from one another. And so why are broccoli and cauliflower, which is botanically the same plant as a Brussels sprout or um, a, a cabbage, why are they not bad for, for, for peppers? Um, and similarly, peppers are in the same family as tomatoes and eggplant and potatoes, but I've never seen those plants go on that same list of you should not plant them together. So I genuinely do not know why broccoli and cauliflower are on the list that you see on most compa companion planting charts um, as being something bad to plant peppers with. And so going back to the idea of allelopathic chemicals, um, there, there is some research that shows that only when rotting or breaking down um, that brassicas might produce a very mild allelopathic chemical that might impact some other vegetable crops. But again, only when rotting. So I'm not sure, maybe that's it. So what I would, what I would really encourage you to do is experiment, experiment, you know, maybe plant broccoli, cauliflower, and peppers closely together in one garden bed. And then in another area of your garden, plant them really, really far apart and see if that makes a difference. Um, be, be a citizen scientist, figure out, figure out, see if you can figure out why um, many, many years ago, those things ended up on opposite sides of a chart. So there are plants that don't well go well together, right? So if, you know, a plant that has some allelopathic properties, you know, is generally not great. But in general, if you're, if you're just talking about vegetables, there's really not a whole lot that's going to have an allelopathic impact on its neighbors. 
And then one, you know, one, one thing definitely to think about um, that, you know, sometimes gets things paired on those companion planting charts is shade. One, one plant simply produces too much shade for another, right? And those are plants that are not bad for each other. They just need to be planted with some distance so that one is not outshading the other. Other, other plants actually grow really well together because one plant provides the other with some shade. So learning about what different plants want can help you create your own chart, your own planting ideas of what grows really well together in your garden, in your unique climate. So other things, um, making sure that if um, plants have really similar um, root space that they take up, um, where they're trying to grow in exactly the same space, um, those aren't gonna grow super well together. Um, you, know, if, you know, if you've ever grown carrots and planted way too many carrot seeds in a small space, you see that, right? Um, you'll, you'll get these really small, twisted um, carrots that just never really get very big. Those are carrots that by planting the carrots together too closely together to themselves um, had a negative impact on one another. Same sort of thing with other plants. And then think about different water or fertilizer requirements for those plants. Um, are they planted at different times of the year? That's a reason to not plant certain plants together sometimes, right? And that's gonna differ a little bit depending on where you live. So getting your hands on a planting calendar um, by date for where you actually live is a really important part of making sure that you're picking the right plants. And then another reason that plants might not grow well together is that there are certain plants that you're gonna find on those planting, those companion planting charts that actually just don't grow where, well where you live. Um, remember that most of those companion planting guides were written with a temperate, not a subtropical climate in mind. Um, most of the United States is a temperate climate. Um, Florida is a subtropical climate. And so when you look at those charts, just keep that in mind. What does make a good companion? Um, it's really just plants that that cohabitate well, right? Like they're like good roommates, they share space well. So they have similar water needs. They're not competing for the same root space. They're planted at the right time of year, the right shade combination and harvesting one doesn't damage the other, right? So, you know, something like trying to pitchfork up your potatoes um, while it's growing under um, green beans, you're gonna kill those green beans. So those don't grow well together. Um, and then, it's also um, you know, really important to make sure that if you're using those companion planting charts, you're not growing plants simply because the chart told you to, right? You have to also want to eat those things that are on the chart. A lot of gardeners plant things because they feel like they're supposed to, even though they don't like those vegetables. And that's not a good companion planting if you don't actually want to eat what you're growing. And one of my favorite examples um, is borage and tomatoes. You'll see borage and tomatoes paired a lot on companion planting charts or um, just on gardening advice forums, things like that. Um, but this is really interesting. There actually have been quite a few scientific studies as to whether or not borage deters tomato hornworms. If you've ever grown tomatoes, you have likely had a tomato hornworm. They can do incredible damage to your garden very quickly. And then you know, in, in addition to the scientific world, not, not seeing any direct correlation between um, borage and tomato hornworms, keeping, keeping those insects off of your, your tomatoes, um, there's a huge amount of debate even within online gardening forums. It's really interesting. It's a pretty split opinion about whether or not it's the magic cure or a bunch of hogwash. But here's what gets lost in that really um, that really intense debate that you'll see on a lot of online garden forums. And that's bees and other pollinators love borage, right? They, they love them. They are very attracted to those beautiful, whimsical blue flowers. Um, they're, they're, so, they're so beautiful and so they bring beauty into your garden. And both the flowers and the leaves of borage are edible. It's an amazing plant for making a simple salad very quickly into something that is quite fancy and absolutely delicious. And on the other end of that spectrum, something else that's lost in that debate of whether or not tomato hornworms deter, um, are deterred by borage in your garden um, is that there may actually, depending on where you live, be a, a better native plant, um, a, a native plant that's a better choice for where you live. Right? Borage is not native to the subtropical parts of the world. It is native to um, the cold, um, 
the cold, damp parts of the world. And so it might not be the best plant for your garden, but not because of the tomato hornworm debate, right? So really think about your own unique place and so many of the other things that we've talked about during this series. And so companion planting, right? To really sum, sum it up, what you need to know about companion planting is that if you love those companion planting charts and you feel like they're a really good guide for you, use them. If you don't, if you feel like there's too many rules or they kind of miss the mark for the general climate that you live in or any other reason, then don't use them, right? Create your own combinations of things that really love growing together. You'll figure it out. And most importantly is that you're choosing the right plants for your unique garden, your unique palette, um, your unique needs and wants and desires in your own garden. And you really can do that by making your own observations and drawing your own conclusions for your unique space. And so that really, in a nutshell, was our goal for this edible gardening series, was to provide you with a framework and encourage you to observe and learn from your own garden, because that's really what it's all about at the end of the day. It's your own unique space. So we hope that you have loved this edible gardening series just as much as we have. Um, we have gone through 25 topics over the last, um, the last seven or so months. Um, and we have, um, we have also created a website because we heard so many people saying, I just joined the series and would really love to get my hands on all of the previous um, recordings and blog posts and resource lists. And so we created a website um, that has all of the previous 25 classes in it. And we'll send that out via, via email as we do every week to everyone who's registered for the series. And with that, we have come to the end of our series. <laughs> We, we do hope that this has been a, a support for you and, um, you know, that you, you feel a little bit more empowered on, on your, in your gardening experience and know that you can do it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And just remember that as you go along with your, um, your gardening, um, things that may seem like a failure on the surface, um, if you turn that into something that you learn from, um, in, the in the grander scheme of things, it's not a failure. It's you know, a pretty neat learning experience every time you step into your garden. So have fun with gardening. Um, gardening is so much fun if you, em if you embrace it for all, of, for all of what it is. And remember that your, your unique garden um, and your, your unique um, hands um, that, that form everything about your garden um, are creating something that is truly just so unique. And over time, um, you will become the expert of your own garden. Um, and until you feel like you have reached that point, um, always, always reach out and ask questions and learn more. So thank you all so very much. And um, it's been a joy to join you all every Monday for the last seven months. So we wish you well. Thank you all so much.